Well, let me go back to zoology for a moment and ask a really rudimentary question, and that is, how many camouflage patterns do you think there are? Not just in an octopus or a fish, but any animal whatsoever. So this is a question that's hardly been asked before. Uh, but I will point out that in our case, we've been studying the cephalopods for a long time, and the short answer, we think, is three, not 50, 500, or 5,000. Those are answers I typically get uh, when I pose this question. And this is a very unusual, counterintuitive kind of answer, and it's up to me to try and give some data to prove that concept. I want to point out, however, that even though there are three basic pattern templates, there's a lot of variation on the theme. So here is a uniform pattern, and we will define this as little to no contrast. I don't care what the color or the brightness is, I'm only interested in little or no contrast and the same pattern from one end of the animal to the other. Mottle might be described in this case as small scale light and dark patches of moderate contrast and some general repetition of the pattern. And of course, on a background that has similar features would create some nice blending in with the background for camouflage. For disruptive coloration, we now have a very different outlay of large-scale, high-contrast, light and dark components, multiple orientations and scales, here partly to break up the recognizable form, but of course, as shown here on the right background, also creating a fair amount of background matching as well. Now, the idea behind this is that if the cephalopods can go anywhere and hide with only three pattern types, that's a big if, uh, it's, is it possible that maybe all animals have just three or four basic pattern types? And how we arrived at this was to take thousands of pictures of our changeable octopus or cuttlefish, and we said, what are we going to do with this mess? Is there some sense to this? And we were able to sort of bin it into three or four categories. That's where we came up with this. So the animals are teaching us the answer. We're not dreaming it up sitting in our desk uh, back in the lab. So with that in mind, I've uh, gone to the trouble, and many of the students in my lab have, to give some examples of uniform patterning. So we've gone all the way from primates to amphibians to reptiles to fishes to insects, and there's a lot of uniform coloration out in the world. We all know that. And on a uniform background, some degree of camouflage will be achieved. Mottled is another kind of general resemblance. Again, you see here are birds and other uh, similar groups that I just showed you. Doesn't matter if the animals are big or little or wet or dry, you can find a lot of these coloration types throughout the animal kingdom. And finally, disruptive, which uh, is quite unusual and exaggerated perhaps the most in a panda bear or um, an orca whale. And these are animals, that you look, the refrain here is that there's an enormous amount of bright white and brightness, large scale, high contrast. And again, in the right background, these can work. Let me get an, an extreme example. You take a panda bear. The panda bears are sometimes arboreal. If that panda bear is viewed up towards a bright morning sunlit sky, your retina washes out with the brightness. You have deep shadows. And now uh, this becomes bright sun. This becomes dark shadow. You cannot connect the dots to recognize that that's a bear. So that's one of the ideas behind disruptive coloration. Now that said, in the biology circles, the hardest, the hardest definition we're trying to support among the zoologists is whether or not disruptive coloration really works in that manner. It's hard experimentally to sort that out. The big significance in our view of this is that if, in fact, and it's not fact yet, there are only three camo pattern types, then the implication is that the amazing diversity of visual systems on this planet be, can be tricked in some degree by, by just three or four pattern types. So we need to go some way towards proving that. So uh, in this publication uh, right here in 2007, I posited some of these ideas based on our collective work on cephalopods and whether or not uh, this might apply on a larger scale. Well, to say the least, this is a provocative idea. It's been controversial. And I would counter by saying, well, it's testable to some degree. So I will present some of those tests today.